Good evening and welcome to worship at Martin Luther. <clears throat> We're glad that you're gathered here tonight uh, to gather around God's word. Tonight we uh, observe a minor festival in the church here, uh, which, is, which actually falls on January 1st, but it's the festival of the name of Jesus. Uh, so tonight we get to know Jesus. Uh, his name means Savior. So the eighth day of a child's life is when Jewish boys were given their names. Uh, and what we'll hear tonight is that Jesus was given the name Jesus, which means Savior, or the Lord saves. And we'll talk about what that means for us and for our lives tonight. Our order of service is printed out for you in your worship folder, also projected onto the screen. We'll begin with our opening hymn. That's two stanzas from O Come All Ye Faithful, and I invite you to stand for the last of those stanzas. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. Eternal Son of God, on this day you were called Jesus, a name that proclaims you to be the Savior of all people. Give us strength in the new year to live each day to the honor of your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Today's first lesson is recorded in Numbers chapter 6. Here we see the name, the Lord places his name on the people to bless them. As God gave Jesus, that name Jesus, that too is to bless us as well. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his favor toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Today's second lesson is recorded in Philippians chapter 2, where it speaks of how Jesus' name is above every other name. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue could acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel is recorded for us in Luke chapter 2, and this will serve as the basis for today's sermon. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated for the hymn of the day. That's the first three stanzas of hymn number 76, Jesus, name of wondrous love. Grace and peace are yours from God our Father, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis of our meditation this evening is today's gospel from Luke chapter 2, which was previously read. Brothers and sisters in Christ. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. 
And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Chances are good that if you've ever been to a children's Christmas service, you've heard a recitation of those words. But what I've noticed is that those recitations pretty much always stop right there and don't include the last verse in that paragraph. That last verse in the paragraph is our gospel lesson for tonight, verse 21, which says, On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Why do we normally skip that verse? Is it just so that the teachers don't have to answer a lot of questions about what circumcision is? Or is it maybe that we prefer to keep those services focused on Christmas and what's going on there and not what happened a week later? I'm not sure. But here we are a week after Christmas, and I figure that now is probably the time for us to talk about this verse. And there's a lot for us to take in here. Because here we really see Jesus start his saving work. We see Jesus start to do what the angel told Joseph he was going to do. It is. He is Jesus. And he will save his people. But to really understand what's going on here, we need to understand a little bit about why they're doing what they're doing. And it has to do with the covenant of circumcision that God had made with Abraham. So God made a covenant with Abraham. He came to Abraham and said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give the land of Canaan to you and your descendants. So God gave all these blessings to Abraham And he asked that in return, Abraham and his descendants would then follow a few laws, including this law of circumcision. It talks about that in Genesis chapter 17. It says, God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So circumcision was an outward sign of the covenant or agreement between God and his people. God was going to bless them. He was going to protect them. He was going to give them a homeland. And the people would then set themselves apart from their neighbors by following God's command, including this command, of circumcision. And what we see in our gospel lesson for today is that Jesus entered into that agreement. When we see Jesus was circumcised, it makes very clear to us that Jesus was expected and obligated to obey the law that God had given. This is what the Apostle Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 4 when he says, When the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, Jesus was true God. Jesus is the one who gave the law. He could have properly be understood as being above the law. But instead, he chose to become a human being, to become one of us who would be under the law. 
And Jesus' circumcision drives that point home. He is under the law, and he is obligated to follow the law. Why would Jesus do that? Well, what the Apostle Paul says here is that Jesus did that. He was born under the law to redeem lawbreakers like you and me. In short, simply put, Jesus was born under the law because he is Jesus, and he will save his people. And that's made very clear from the name that was given to him at his circumcision. He was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. You see, the name Jesus means the Lord saves. And today we see Jesus begin his saving work. At his circumcision, we see that Jesus was subject to the law. And as the Savior, Jesus was going to keep the law. You see, over the next three months in church, we're going to hear a lot about Jesus' life and ministry. And each week when you come to church, you're going to hear a portion of the gospel being read. And, each, and in each of those gospel lessons, you'll hear about Jesus saying or doing something. And every time you hear the gospel and you see Jesus do something, you can look at that and say, there is the Lord saving me. Because when Jesus obeyed the law, he obeyed it for lawbreakers like you and me. And you can count on the fact that Jesus did that perfectly, and he did it in your place. Because that's who Jesus is. He will save his people. So what does that mean for you? That means that where you have failed, Jesus succeeded. You see, while you and I don't live under the Abrahamic covenant of circumcision, God still has some expectations for us. We still live under the law in that sense that God has expectations for you and me. And the standard that God has set, what he expects from us, is perfection. Perfection. God wants us to love other people, all the people that he's put around us, so perfectly that we love them just as God loves them. And we don't live up to that perfect standard fall far short of it. We don't always fully nurture our relationships or our talents or our time. And if you just want an example of that, you can think of the idea of New Year's resolutions. right? I, I know there are different opinions about how to approach that, whether you should make resolutions or not, or, or how you should approach that. But I think that we could all acknowledge that there are some things in each of our lives that should change. Or at least that there are things in each of our lives that could be better. And if that's true for you, that means that you're not perfect. And God says that in order to live with him in paradise, you need to be perfect. And that's why I'm really glad that Luke 2.21 is in the Bible. Because there we see that God has provided us with exactly the Savior that we needed. We have a Savior who was born under the law, who kept the law perfectly. And we see that start today. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day just as the law required and he would continue to keep every one of God's laws perfectly every moment for every day of his life. And he did that for you. So now when God looks at you, he doesn't see your imperfections. Instead, he sees you just as perfect as Jesus. Because that's what Jesus came to do came to be the savior that you needed and he kept the law in your place because Jesus
came to save his people. See, the Lord saves not just in that he came to be born under the law to keep the law in your place. The Lord also saves you by suffering to take your sins away. And today we see that Jesus was willing to suffer to save you. Now that, that's something maybe we don't think about too often because it's a little weird. But let's maybe just embrace the weirdness here for a second, okay? The almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing Son of God knew what happened to Jewish boys on the eighth day of their lives. And he had volunteered to endure that for you. Why would he do that? Volunteered to go through that because he knew that he would need to suffer in order to save you. And this certainly wouldn't be the last of his suffering. Jesus would live for more than three decades in this world where he would experience pain and fatigue and sadness. And of course, he would endure the most terrible suffering of all when he suffered the punishment for the sins of the world on the cross. But Jesus went through all that for you because there was nothing that would get in his way of saving you because that's who he is and that's what he does. He is Jesus and he will save his people. Verse 21 might not make anyone's list of top 10 verses in Luke chapter 2 but let's not forget that it's in there. And today, let's thank God that it's in there. Because there we see that God has given us the exact Savior that we needed. A Savior who was born under the law to keep the law perfectly in your place. And that's what he did. A Savior who was willing to suffer to save you. And that's what he did. Because that's who he is. He is Jesus, and he has saved his people. And thank God for that. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now uh, confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and died and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the time in our service when we would normally offer our gifts to the Lord out of thanksgiving to him and all that he has done for us. We won't be passing the plate at this time, uh, but there is an offering plate at the back of the sanctuary. You can drop an offering in there on your way out if you would like. We'll continue then with our offering hymn.
radiant and majestic Lord, whom to know is to love, and to love is to adore, we kneel before your throne in humble reverence. If we could sing like angels, we might express the height and breadth and depth of our devotion. How weak and tuneless are our songs of praise. How desperately shallow and unmoving are our words of adoration. How weak and meager are the deeds of our devotion. Our prayers and praise are caught within us, unsung and unspoken. What is beyond our uttering, dear God, receive as earnest, honest veneration. You have come down to be our sinfulness, so that we may be clothed in your righteousness. You have descended to our low estate, so that we may be carried to heavenly heights. You have done the whole law's bidding, so that we may walk free of its condemnation. You died that we might have life and have it more abundantly. What a great and gracious God you are, more greatly to be praised than we are able. We yearn to give you proper honor. Accept our prayers, dear Lord, our praise, and lead us to our heavenly home, where words and deeds and voices will be able and worthy to sing and say and do what honors you. We ask that you hear us now as we join together to pray as you have taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our next hymn. That's two stanzas from O Jesus So Sweet, O Jesus So Mild. Please stand for prayer. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, Go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Good evening. Once again, welcome to Martin Luther. We're glad that you're here tonight. We'd invite you to return to worship with us again soon. Uh, as far as announcements go, um, we are returning back to our normal schedule. Uh, we won't have Bible class tomorrow morning, but after that, we will resume our uh, midweek, uh, our midweek Bible classes, and then start up Sunday school and Bible class next Sunday. Um, so plan accordingly. I'd encourage you to get plugged into one of those. We also have an update tonight from Nina Lutheran School, a uh, short little video uh, to update on the things that have happened at the school this past quarter. As you leave tonight, uh, you won't be ushered out, uh, so go ahead and leave whenever you are ready. Uh, if you are not going to take your bulletins with you, uh, please toss them. Um, you can keep a bit of distance as you leave on the way out. I won't be shaking hands in the back like I normally would, uh, but I'll be available up front if anyone would like to talk. With that, I wish you a blessed evening in the Lord.